Thank you all for being here on this beautiful, warm afternoon. What a wonderful day to rebegin our traditional 4th of July celebration. Agreed? Agreed? All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all your help. Many of you have been involved in this in many ways. It's always a team effort when we pull something like this off, and I think it's going to happen. So thank you so much for being here. It's very encouraging to all of us who work to maintain our community's rich history. And we have a part of our history on exhibit today. Right in front of you is an axe head, and I assume it's the older one. Yes, that was actually found in the cellar hole up on Eagle Ledge and Shepherd's Hill where Plummer Richardson homesteaded and lived. So it's quite possible that that axe head was Plummer's wife's axe head. <laughs> she didn't use it very good, well, she did she? She sure didn't. <laughs> Thank you, Michael Close, for that wonderful music at the beginning of our ceremony today. One of our talented residents. And if you want to hear something beautiful, when he comes out of his house overlooking the valley and the village and starts playing Amazing Grace, resounds throughout the hills, it's a treat. Thank you, Michael. Do it more often, please. <laughs> At the end of our, our, our presentation today, uh, we'll ask you to stand for taps that he is going to play for us uh, as a fitting in to this uh, somewhat a memorial, not only to a family, but to the residents of Worcester and to those who suffered, including everybody in the Civil War era. Once upon a time, not so very long ago, about 1846, I reckon, a family of four brothers and their parents up and moved from Berkshire, Orange County, Vermont, to a remote mountainside in Worcester. John Richardson and his boys cleared trees and rocks and created enough tillable land to farm. John's wife, Lydia Smith, birthed a daughter, Lucy Belinda, shortly after settling on the slope of the Worcester Range, and parts of the original homestead are still owned by John and Lydia's descendants. One George Richardson inhabits the area today. The family made ends meet off the farm and working in the woods. Three of the four brothers served in the Union Army during the Civil War. Plummer and Calvin enlisted in the 13th Regiment of the Vermont Volunteers, in 1862, and Alonzo, the oldest of the four, chose the 6th regiment, res regiment a year later. Joel stayed close to home to help his dad, but when the boys got together after the war, there was always conversation, sometimes rather heated, about who had it the hardest. That's where we joined them this hot afternoon in 1867. Up at the end of Minister Brook, not far from the sawmill, that they'd helped their dad build. Joel is complaining to Plummer and Calvin. Alonzo is still at work down at the mill. While you fellows were off having the time of your lives, I was here on this hard scrabble farm, trying to keep the family together, working from sun up past sundown. There was always some chore to be done, field to be plowed, potatoes to dig, cows to milk, corns to sh corn to shuck, firewood to cut, and fences to fix. Think I ever had an evening to go down to the village for a little fun? And you might as well forget Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> now, Joel, what would you know about Courtney anyway? Right. Just a waste of time, I'd say. <laughs> you, you're, you're one to know anything about Courtney. Sure didn't take you long to take a bride when you got out of the army. And now you're going to be a papa soon and adding changing diapers to your expertise. <laughs> Poor Ellen Corey. She didn't know what she was in for. Joel was right. Ellen Corey didn't know what she was in for. <laughs> Between 1868 and 1888, Ellen Corey bore Plummer 10 children. Oh, wow. oh, 
<laughs> it sure would have been nice to have some more hands out in the woods during lumbering season. It was all I could do to look after the farm and livestock. But working in the woods was especially hard whilst you guys were gone. I had to make sure father was safe as well. He's not as young as he used to, you know. Oh, come on, Joel. You know that father can put in a day's work while you're still up and dressed trying to get your pants on. All right. <laughs> he can cut a cord of wood before you even get your ax sharpened. And everyone in the village knows that. And furthermore, you got to work outside in the clean air and enjoy the seasons and the woods and the fields. Such a chore. I heard tell your 13th regiment didn't have to do much work at all. Didn't see any fighting. Right till the end of your obligation. You spent all your time doing picket duty around the nation's capital, protecting it from the rebs, even though there weren't no rebels in a hundred miles. Jesus, Must have been there. nice to see all those fancy buildings and officers and such. Well, you are right, Paul. That part of it is kind of exciting. Sure more interesting than what we got around here. But I'll <laughs> tell you something about that glorious home during our time in Washington. Thousands of men living in tents amongst mosquitoes, lice, fleas, and vermin of all sorts and sizes. Camp streets littered with garbage, food and waste, some of it in advanced stages of rotting. Odors of human waste and latrines built all too close to the flimsy tents we occupied. Uncovered latrines so foul that men tended to relieve themselves wherever they had the urge. That's the truth. Throw in the odors of entrails of slaughtered animals. You get the idea of our lovely settlement. <laughs> Sounds a lot like working around the barn 16 hours a day. <laughs> we assure you, brother, this fresh air and the smell of wood smoke is next to perfume compared mm -hmm. to the stench of that camp. Is that right, Plumber? What no picnic. And you know that me and Plumber was never too fond of farming to begin with. According to estimates, two out of every three soldiers, or 66%, died not from battles, but rather from disease. For every day in battle, the average soldier spent 50 days idle in camp. What about Gettysburg? I guess you finally got to smell a little powder and hear a few mini balls pass overhead. Was you scared of them rebels? Joel, I don't have much to say about that terrible battle. I'll let Calvin tell you about the thrilling incidents of Gettysburg battle, mm -hmm. but I will say that I was very glad of a chance to enlist and get away from the farm, of course. Amen. I was as ignorant of what was to be required of me as a soldier as possible. I was anxious to go, and Father said, Go! Be sure when in battle not to be shot in the back, but stand by the flag and do your best. And also said, I would rather never see you again than hear you ran in the rear in time of battle. Right. Calvin can attest to which way I ran toward or from the enemy all the time. I sure can. I was expecting to be shot at any time. After our nine months was up, as you know, I had done good. Rode up a lot, and Father gave me permission to re-enlist, which I did, joining Alonzo in the 6th Regiment, Company K. I was now ready for any action, and we saw plenty of it. Indeed. I don't regret a single day I served and did my part as best I could to save our country. Well, you sound downright patriotic, brother. Yes, you deserve a medal for facing them rebels. Who's going to give me a medal for keeping the home front safe and secure? Who's going to give me a medal for all I've done to save our country? Guess I know the answer to that. Now, Joel, don't feel that way. Let me tell you what you missed. In the spring of 1863, while in that lovely camp, there was every indication of a battle between General Hooker and General Lee, and rumor said that if we would have orders to join General Hooker's army of the Potomac, now on the north bank of the Rappahannock, on his way to capture Richmond. Many doubted this because our time in the service was near end, and besides, we had no experience in fighting. 
and General Hooker would not accept any raw troops when about to lock horns with General Lee. We then thought that General Hooker was the best man and we had the largest and best equipped army and many of our boys were anxious to go. And it was only some 30 miles to Fredericksburg and we could make that march in a single day if necessary. I wanted to have one genuine fight before I returned home. Was not satisfied with the fight we had at Fairfax Court House when General J.E.B. Stewart attempted to capture us on that December night when Colonel Randall was down in Alexandria. Mm. We heard the cannons at Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville when General Hooker started for Richmond, but no orders came for us. We heard in a day or two that General Hooker and his army had been whipped, badly whipped, by General Lee, and our army was obliged to retreat back to the north bank of the Rappahannock. Enough of all of this. Get to the good stuff. <laughs> okay. In a few days, the whole Potomac Army was on the way north to overtake General Lee and his army, who had done, who had gone down the valley of Shenandoah into Maryland on their way to capture Washington. Wow. Then we were sure that a great battle was at hand, and our brigade. would have part and share in it, and so we did. General Standard was not our brigadier general, and we were willing to fight wherever he might lead. It turned out the boys of Company C that reached Gettysburg had a good chance to fight in their full satisfaction. I know I did. The long march day after day in the rain and through mud and water was pretty hard for me, and had it not been for Captain Coburn giving me a ride on his horse now and then, would never reach the battlefield of Gettysburg. I had been sick in camp with the mumps and was in bad shape when I started. You had the mumps? You never told us that. Believe me, Joel, there was a lot of things I never told y'all. My old army shoes got filled with mud and gravel and my feet were sore and blistered long before we reached Edwards Ferry, where we crossed on a pontoon bridge in the Maryland. The captain let the boys ride their, his horse and he went afoot, and in his way, in this way, quite a number of us reached Gettysburg that otherwise would have been left behind. The fighting was terrible, and I was a little scared at first. Bet you were. It was a new business, and the cannonballs came all about us, bursting in the air, and pieces flying in all directions. Samuel Pratt, who was close to me, was hit in the leg. I thought it was a hot place and mighty dangerous. One of the Slayton boys, Arrow was also lucky. A bullet took away his hat brim, and then minutes later, as he stooped to pick up a knife, a shell slammed past to where his head had been, killing and wounding several men beyond. I soon became a little used to the noise and exploding shells, so went down in Plum Run Valley, using guns and bayonets, and capturing General Pickett's brave boys. I forgot about all the danger. Must have been excited. The boys were captured, we captured seemed very willing to be taken out of that slaughter pen to the rear. Company C carried the flags, and I was near them, and the two big boys that carried them never flinched or wavered on that charge. Old Glory was to the front fluttering in the breeze, and never was in the hands of braver boys than on this occasion. That's right. It was a glorious fight, and I was glad I was in it. Well, mm. I can honestly say, I am glad you was there, not me. I am surely glad neither one of you was wounded. Look who's finally coming to join his younger brothers. Oh, nice. The bearded there. wonder. On the Private way. Alonzo Richardson, hero of the battles in the wilderness, Spotsylvania, Winchester, Petersburg, and even Appomattox Courthouse, where he brought General Lee to his knees, begging for mercy. I believe it. Yes, my fame reaches far and wide, and you forgot, Cold Harbor. <laughs> Wasn't that where you took a slight medical leave for a bit of a vacation? You blockhead, that mini ball nearly killed me. Oh. I heard it was just a flesh wound. <laughs> Why, I was more near severely injured when old Nellie kicked me in the knee. <laughs> Laid me up for two whole months, and I didn't have no fancy doctors looking after me. Are you sure she didn't kick you up a little higher, trying to knock some sense into you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. All right, now. Let's calm down. Now, remember, Joel, our oldest brother, the illustrious Alonzo, weren't a spit 
as we were, being so much older than we are. <laughs> that's apparent. He just needed to get his strength back. That's all. <laughs> so all you knuckleheads think you had it rough? You two in your nine months enlistment and single battle at Gettysburg? You had to having to do a little farm work to get to sleep in your own bed every night? Let me tell you what rough is all about. Being in a trench 60 yards away from the rebels, facing you in a plowed field in better and stronger earthworks. Watching as a few men not far from you raise their heads to see what could be seen and taking a bullet right between the peepers, right through their skull to eternity. Hearing the order to leave the trenches, form a line and assault the rebel earthworks amidst a hail of balls. Seen a three mile long battle line of 40,000 strong advancing across the field. Watching a slaughter of men in blue, 7,000 Union soldiers shot in less than 40 minutes. Mm. Then feeling the sting of the bullet as it entered my right shoulder, knocking me to the ground. I felt the pain. I smelt the blood and gunpowder. But I was lucky. A lot of our boys lay wounded in that battlefield for several days, begging for help, water, and mercy. I had enough strength to crawl back to the rear, away from that slaughter pan at Cold Harbor, and get some relief. You might remember I was at a commission from June 4th until September 17th, being in hospitals in Washington, Pennsylvania, and right back here close to home in Montpelier. My shoulder wound had gotten infected and I almost lost my arm. Still, I tell you, I was real lucky, thanks to good doctoring and nursing I got. I'm still a whole man, and I can do twice as much woodcutting in now as you three can do together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Even though the boys took great pride in their ability to supply firewood throughout the region, their father, John, may have been even better. A local newspaper reported in 1874 that 77 year old John Richardson, the father of these four brothers, had delivered nearly a thousand logs to the mill near the village, four miles from the homestead, just in a couple of months. Here comes some lady up the road on horseback. You boys try to act like gentlemen now. Right, this may right. be an opportunity to change your life. <laughs> I know that lady. It's just Nurse Harriet Hinkson coming up to check on me and mom. Don't mean to dash your hopes, but she's already got a man who she met at the hospital in Montpelier while he was there recuperating Bad for you. from having some of his fingers shot off while serving in the 11th Regiment. Well, good afternoon, boys. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I see you're out and about now, sir, and that's a real good sign. I could hear you fellows complaining. All the way down the valley. That wasn't complaining. Yeah, no, that well, wasn't us. That's you know how the sound carries down there. You best be careful. The whole town will find out about your secrets. They already know them. <laughs> Thanks for the warning, Mrs. Holmes. We surely won't want the whole village to learn about the pitiful condition of my family. You know how my brothers think they have had it such a tough go of it in the army. To hear them, you'd think they were the only ones who had to carry a burden for the country. Oh, I guess we all had a tough time of it these past few years. I've certainly seen my share of heartache. Losing my brother Calvin and first cousin Edwin to the cause was something I'll never get over. Calvin shot right out of the tree by another sniper. And Edwin took by lung fever. But at least he got to come home and die in his own bed. I'm sure you saw more suffering and misery nursing up on the hill in Montpelier. Oh, yes, Alonzo. It certainly was no party. You know, it was kind of unusual how that all came about. You remember, as a teenager, I was intent on, on helping those who were sick and feeble, especially neighbors and family members. I was just 16 years old when I started nursing up at the Sloan Army Hospital as a real nurse. I served up there the last two years of the war. And I saw enough suffering to last a lifetime. We were very fortunate to have a hospital so close to home, especially for our boys. Burlington and Brattleboro were just too far away. I rode my mare into Montpelier most days from the farm on Eagle Ledge. Although while Dad and my brother were off fighting the war, Mother and I had to do all the farm work as well. 
lot of people don't remember the work we women had to do in the absence of you men folk. <coughs> I really don't think anybody had an easy time of it during those years. That's the truth. I saw suffering and pain up there at Sloan. I saw men who would never walk again, having limbs severed by shrapnel and amputation, missing arms and disfigured in all manner and fashion, men on crutches, men in wheelchairs, men whose spirits and souls were crushed, spent and torn into many pieces. Your brother Alonzo was extremely lucky to be able to return to a normal life, if uh, you can call living among three brothers like you are normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. But by the way, how is your mother? Well, she seems to be doing fine. Getting over the cholera just about did her in. Without your good nursing and Dr. Harris's treatments, you could have lost her. Well, your mother is a strong woman, and she helped pull herself through the worst of it. I'm going to ride on up to the house and check in on her. And by the way, now, Kate Hutchinson is going to join us in a little while to do some quilting and have some tea. Don't scare her too much. <laughs> uh, we'll try not to. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Mrs. you Mrs. Holmes. Holmes. Mother, looking forward to seeing you. I'm sure. Harriet Hinkson Holmes died in 1945 at the age of 102. She lived in Worcester for 84 years and did her own sewing and knitting without glasses until she was 98 years old, at which time she bought some glasses. <laughs> On April 27, 2002, a special ceremony was held right here to dedicate the monument over there to commemorate her status as the last Civil War nurse in Vermont. She and her husband, Clark Holmes, are buried just a few rows over. She outlived him by 40 years. Yeah, I'm glad Harriet warned us about Miss Hutchinson yeah, coming true. up. She is still much in grief over the loss of her firstborn. I'm sure it is difficult to lose a child, but her loss was well over five years ago. Last time I saw her, she was still wearing black. Yeah, yeah some so. people take things like that a lot harder than others. Well, I heard tell of a lady over in Cabot, Josephine Lance, I think was her name, has become a recluse after her fiancé was killed at Appomattox. <laughs> she hasn't been out of her room since she got the news. Well, I see a wagon coming up over the hill there. That must be her now. <laughs> now, boys, let's be civil and let her pass with due respect. Afternoon, Mrs. Hutchinson. I hope you are well on this fine afternoon. I suppose I'm about as well as can be expected under the circumstances. You probably know that I lost my firstborn yeah. and that my husband couldn't leave his company in order to come home. Yes, ma'am, we extend our sincere sympathy to you and Lemuel. Our sympathy. Thank you. We had such a great life before that darn war came along. We had a good farm right down there at the end of the road on your way to Montpelier. And then we were blessed with Willie. Life was so hopeful. But then Lemuel, he felt he should go and defend his country. He was only 25 years old when he enlisted in the 8th Regiment of the Vermont Volunteers. He mustered in as a sergeant in A Company and rising to the rank of captain when they transferred him to Company E. He served under Stephen Thomas the entire war and he had a really rough go of things. He got captured by the rebels in Louisiana in October of 62 paroled out of there after being imprisoned for two months. And then he got wounded at Cedar Creek, Virginia, where about 80% of his men 
were either wounded or killed after that terrible attack. And me, I was alone without him for a long time, and the one ray of sunshine I had was my Willie. He was a wonderful lad, full of happiness and mischievousness, but he took sick in March of 63, and the inflammation took the light out of his life on March 27th. Word could not get to his father in order for him to come <coughs> home in time, so I endured the sorrow alone. And in my sorrow, I wrote this little lament that actually ended up in the newspaper. Let me read it to you. I know by one sweet token, my Willie is not dead. One golden clue he left me as on his track he sped. Were he some gem or blossom, but fashioned for today, my love would slowly perish with his dissolving clay. Oh, I would not recall thee, my glorious angel boy. Thou needest not my bosom, rare bud of life and joy. Here dash I down the teardrops, still gathering in my eyes. Blessed, oh how blessed, in adding a seraph to the skies. That is certainly a beautiful piece of writing, Mrs. <coughs> Hutchinson. Very moving. I am sure you were mighty glad to have the captain safely home from the battlefield, even though he had to recover from his wounds. Yes, ma'am, you're surely you have been worn a great burden having to grieve over your loss, worrying about your husband and taking care of all the responsibilities of working the farm. You women and folk have not been thanked enough for helping keeping the home fires burning during the terrible crisis. Thank you. Why, thank you, Joel. I am sure that you boys have all done your share. But, well, it's time for me to get up to the house with Lydia. We've got some sewing to do and some gossiping. Oh, that yeah, we'll take all. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Joel. You heard what she said about how your brothers have done their share? Yeah. Come on, brothers. <laughs> let up on poor old Joel. Somebody had to stick around and make sure mother and dad were doing all right. By the way, Joel, I thought you handled Mrs. Hutchinson with a lot of tenderness and respect. I didn't hear any of your courageous brothers say a peep. <laughs> we were speechless. <laughs> After the war and Lemuel's discharge, he and Kate were able to raise four children. Lemuel represented Worcester in the state legislature when he introduced a bill which became a law providing for the establishment of the Veteran Soldiers Home in Bennington. Lemuel and family moved to Montpelier in 1880. His father, Thomas, had passed in 1876, having built the house where Lemuel and Kate lived, better known as the Cliff Mullen Place now, and the house on the corner of Worcester Village and Downs Road was also built by Thomas Hutchinson. Prior to their occupying those two dwellings, they occupied the house across from Balsam Acres Farm, presently occupied by Tom Lang. Thomas Hutchinson's brother, Elisha, who came to Worcester with him, was killed in a blasting accident at the construction site of the Second State House in 1834 in Montpelier. Interestingly enough, Lemuel's daughter, Catherine, <coughs> was a successful actress in New York City in the early 1900s. She acted in six Broadway plays between 1902 and 1907, appearing in one black and white silent movie called Square Deceiver. Interesting, brothers, that the war is still so much on our minds. We talk about it daily. Some of us are permanently scarred by the wounds and sickness. We even seek out others who experienced it at the Captain Edward Hall GAR meeting. If Captain Hall could have his say about who has the hardest, I wonder what he'd tell us. 
Howdy. Captain Edward E. Hall. Everyone calls my Ed, except my youngest daughter calls me Eddie because she knows it makes me hotter than a cat in a wash tub. Yeah. <laughs> I was the highest ranking officer from Worcester to give his life in battle. That was the one down on Cedar Creek in Virginia in the late Civil War. I was born in New Hampshire in 1860, but moved here to Worcester and farmed 100 acres up on the Middlesex Worcester line. My first wife, Mary, died, so in 1848, I married Francis Smith here in Worcester. I was commissioned commander of Company E, 8th Regiment, on January 1st, 1862, soon after I enlisted. While guarding a train station near Bayou de Alamond in Louisiana, I, along with three fellow officers, 137 enlisted men, including three men from Worcester, Frank Sheridan, Leo Slayton, and Charles Smith. We were all captured by a much larger rebel band. While being held prisoner in Louisiana, we witnessed one of the great atrocities of the war. I was later moved as a captive to Vicksburg, Mississippi, and on the ship island, where I was paroled and returned to my regiment on February 18, 1863. I received a slight head wound from buckshot during the Battle of Port Hudson in June 14th of 1863. When my three-year commission was up, I decided to re-enlist, and I did so on January 5th, 1864. I was making so much more than I could have ever had on the farm. On October 19th of that same year, my career came to an end on the battlefield, Cedar Creek in Virginia, near Winchester. The Montpelier Argus and Patriot, in its November 10th edition, told the details of my final command. <laughs> A gallant officer dead. Among those killed at the Battle of Cedar Creek, Virginia on the 19th was Captain Edward Hall of Worcester, who commanded Company E in the 8th Regiment. In the morning, he was shot in the leg during the attack by the rebels under General Early upon our troops under General Sheridan. While being carried off the field, he was shot again in the body. He then fell into the hands of the rebels and was carried over Cedar Creek. When we recovered the lost ground later in the day, he was found by our troops and carried to the hospital where he died after suffering for 10 days. He became connected with the 8th Regiment at its formation, and while that regiment was in Louisiana, was taken prisoner, remaining in the hands of the Rebs for several months. He was a brave man and an excellent officer, a good citizen, and very highly esteemed by all who knew him. He leaves a wife with two children and was aged 48 years. <laughs> Assistant Surgeon Ollie Ross told me that Maroons was mortal. I took a mini ball through the upper gut, another one in the thigh, and it was from these wounds that I expired on October 29th, 1864. My mortal remains were shipped back here to Worcester to this very place where I was buried in the Worcester Village Cemetery within sight of my beloved Worcester Mountains. Fellow veterans from Worcester, Civil War veterans, honored my memory by naming the local post 39 of the Grand Army of the Republic the Edward E. Hall Post. All told, I was one of 12 men from Worcester who gave all that he was to help preserve our union. I reckon that is the ultimate. Give it all, right down to your very life. None of us will ever be the same. We all gave all we were called to give. Even Joel? Even, Even Joel. Joel. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, brothers, for giving me a little peace of mind. So get up off your lazy, lazy behinds and help me get a couple of cords of wood cut before the sun sets. Hopefully these ladies will leave a few pieces of mama's apple pie. Now, that's a piece of another kind. Another thing you got to enjoy while we were out saving the union. The list just gets longer and longer. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Despite their disdain for farming, all the brothers ended up farmers in Worcester. The oldest, Alonzo, was the primary transmitter of the family culture. It is said he used to mesmerize young children of the family by methodically drawing out the hunting knife he always kept in his boot, yanking a hair out of his foot-long beard, and blithely cutting the hair in pieces to demonstrate the sharpness of the blade. Alonzo was the father of six, died at age 86. Calvin Richardson farmed on Minister Brook Road for the rest of his life after being discharged. His wife was a cousin, Amy Richardson, who died in 1920. 
By 1922, Calvin lived with his brother Joel, who was also a widower. Both men were octogenarians, being known in the community for making pies. <laughs> Calvin died at age 88. Joel, the oldest resident in Worcester at the time of his death of 91 in 1939, experienced some pain in his life when he broke his arm in a freak accident at a sawmill in Putnamville in 1907. It even made the paper. Plummer, the youngest of the four, farmed out on Eagle Ledge and Shepherd's Hill, and with his wife, Ellen Corey, fathered 10 children, six who lived to adulthood. Three of these young men sitting before you are great-grandchildren of Plummer Richardson. Many of the descendants of these four siblings reside here in Worcester today and are still just as spirited. <laughs> <laughs> Would you stand with me for taps? You will note as we conclude our presentation, there are several stones around the cemetery that have balloons on them. These are the grave stones of the seven individuals that we have portrayed in this reenactment. Thank you so much for your attendance. Happy Fourth of July, everyone. <laughs>